Well, good morning. It's uh, great to be back here and have the opportunity to share God's word with you again. I could probably spend the next 30 minutes just saying some words of thank you uh, to all of you, but I'll try to just spend a few minutes or a couple minutes here doing that this morning. Um, I want to thank all of you for praying for me and for my family. I know that many of you were concerned for us as uh, we recovered from the virus, um, but we're all doing a lot better now. And um, yeah, it's just we're thankful for all of you praying for us. Uh, as one friend said, he would pray me out of heaven for the sake of my family. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, also, many of you were involved in providing food for us and making special deliveries of uh, groceries and stuff for us. Uh, you know, usually when you're sick, you have a tendency to lose weight. I think I probably gained uh, 10 pounds uh, over that couple of weeks while you were all bringing us so much food. But we just have to thank you for the way that you showed such love for us. And uh, I'm not surprised at all in the way that you showed such love for us. Um, but I just am grateful, just really grateful. And then again, you know, you, as a church family, you blessed both my family and Pastor Justin's family uh, this last week with a very generous gift uh, for Christmas. And yeah, I, you know, words aren't sufficient to say thank you for the way you've just blessed us and uh, made it very clear to us uh, how much you love us and appreciate us, and we're very thankful for that. And obviously, of course, I have to say thank you to Justin. Wow, what an amazing job he did in the last few weeks of, of really stepping up to the plate. I like to use those sports metaphors, but man, I, I can't imagine... Uh, how we would have gone through all that we've gone through this year, but especially in the last few weeks without Justin. Uh, he was very gracious and very willing and uh, was really wanting to make sure that I didn't try to rush back uh, foolishly, but that he was just willing to go ahead and take the sermons off my plate for the last few weeks. So I'm just so thankful uh, for uh, what a good friend and what a good partner in ministry we have here in Pastor Justin. So when I prepared a number of weeks ago or months ago now for the Advent season, I was intending on preaching the four, <laughs> the four Advent messages. And uh, as it turns out, we had a, another pastor from my parents' church in the Phoenix area, Costi Hinn, preached the first Advent message. And then Justin ended up doing the last three. And he ended up deciding that he wanted to go ahead and preach the same passages that I had already selected ahead of time uh, for each of those four Advent themes. Before I got sick, I had already prepared a message on that first theme, that first theme of, of hope. And, uh, you know, over the years, I've preached many Christmas messages. Uh, I've spent many Sundays in Matthew chapter 2 and Luke chapter 2 and then of course back in Isaiah 7 14 and Isaiah 9 and some of those classic Christmas passages but this year I decided that I really wanted to focus in on those four themes that we see at Advent traditionally and I'm thankful for Karen Joyner organizing all of the the various families that have done the Advent readings for those four weeks so I had prepared a message on hope and then, of course, I wasn't able to preach it. Uh, so this week, as I had a short week, I decided that I'd go ahead and, and use that message because I feel like God put some things on my heart. And I also realized, you know, we can never use, or we can never have too much hope. We can always use more hope, right? Especially this year, the year 2020, as, as discouraging and as difficult as this year has been for us to double up on hope is really not a bad thing at all. And the message that I found from Costi Hinn on hope, he also spoke from 1 Peter chapter 1, but he spoke on different verses than I intended to. And so I would ask you to go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 13 through 21. So we have, over the last four weeks, focused on those four classic themes of Advent— hope, love, joy, and peace. And so today, with the help of Peter, we're going to go back to that first theme again, which I think is a fitting way to finish off this year and prepare our hearts for a new year, is to be reminded of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. 
Would you just join me in a, in a moment of prayer as uh, we prepare our hearts to learn from God's word? Father, so thankful for the privilege of, of standing here today and opening your word. So thankful for this church family. Lord, it's, it's obviously difficult as we finish 2020 uh, for me to be speaking to a camera again and for our church family to be watching this on their computers or their phones or whatever. But Lord, we know that there are better days to come. Uh, we know that we will um, be able to gather together again. And we know that no matter what happens in this life, there's going to be an incredible gathering together of fellowship and worship and joy and celebration when we all get to gather together in heaven with people from many tribes and tongues and people and languages. People from all nations will gather together and celebrate and worship. And so, Lord, we have that hope today. And so I thank you for that. I ask that you would speak to our hearts very clearly, that you would give me the strength, allow me to kind of get out of the way, and I ask that your Holy Spirit would minister to our church family through this passage of Scripture. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, I did ask you to uh, open, excuse me, to open to 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to get into that passage, but I want to start with a different verse uh, from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13, Paul has this profound statement that he makes. And this is a verse that when I was preparing this message back four weeks ago now, uh, really was just resonating in my mind. It just kept coming to the surface in my heart and my mind over and over again. And especially as we had just experienced prior to this message that I was going to preach, we had just experienced the, the home going, the passing away from this life to the next of our beloved sister Susan. That was a very, obviously a huge loss for us, a very painful thing for, for me as a pastor and, and obviously, of course, for the family and friends of Susan. I found myself one day just just sitting and weeping, uh, weeping over the fact that, that I wasn't going to see her again in this life, uh, weeping over the fact that I, I wasn't able to be in person at the memorial service because I was quarantined, uh, weeping just over the loss and, and weeping for the family and thinking of just uh, what a central figure Susan was for that family and how difficult this season was going to be for them. But I kept coming back to 1 Thessalonians 4.13 in my heart and in my mind, where Paul says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, which is a, a way of speaking of Christians dying, asleep. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Now, Paul in that verse is not saying that we shouldn't grieve because in one of his other letters, of course, to the Romans, he says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. There's nothing wrong with grieving. Obviously, it's an emotion that God has given us. It's a reality of the life that we live here on this earth. He's not saying that it's bad to grieve, but he's saying we don't grieve as non-believers do who have no hope. We grieve as those who have hope. And so it's amazing that at the same time that we could be grieving and sad for ourselves, we can be rejoicing and celebrating for Susan and for others who we have lost this year. Uh, uh, many family members, many loved ones, many friends have gone on to be with the Lord Jesus. And so we grieve those losses for our sake, but we rejoice because of the hope that we have in Christ. Well, we better get into 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 21. And there's an outline that was connected here, uh, a link to the outline that you got in an email or is on the YouTube page. But number one, the number one in your outline is hope for grace. Hope for grace. Look at verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope 
fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hope for grace. Grace has been described by many over the years as the, the keynote, the, the, the most important word in all of Christianity, the grace of God. The grace of God that gives us what we don't deserve, closely related to the mercy of God that doesn't give us what we do deserve. The grace of God that not only wipes our slate clean and washes our sin away, but also empowers us for new life. The grace of God. We could study this subject of the grace of God every day of our lives for the rest of our lives and even perhaps for all of eternity and we could never get to the end of the richness, the greatness of this concept of God's grace. One study Bible I had says about this verse, Peter enters now the more practical matters of obedience and endurance under hardship. And yet the grounding of the gospel is his ever-present offering of help in these matters. Believers are first commanded not to set their hope on their own efforts or their own strength, but fully on the grace of that will be completely and finally manifested when Christ returns. We are granted grace here and now, and yet this grace will be publicly displayed before the whole world upon Christ's second coming. Again, notice that he says, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you. And again, like that note said, don't set your hope on on yourself, Don't set your hope on your own works. Don't set your hope on anything that this world has to offer you. You know, we right now are experiencing a time of great trouble and and struggle in the world with with this coronavirus and many of the other things that are going on in our country today. But our hope is not in who will govern us politically. Our hope is not even in the fact that there may be a vaccine just around the corner for this virus. Our hope is not, does not have to do with anything that this world can do for us or anything that we think we can do for ourselves. Our hope is fully and completely and totally to be in God, to be in Jesus Christ, to be in the grace that he has given us. And that grace that he says will ultimately be manifested when Jesus Christ comes again. Peter here kind of goes back to verse 3, which of course we haven't looked at that passage, but Costi Hinn preached on that passage if you watched that message. And in verse 3 of chapter 1, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He goes back here and goes back to that word hope, referring to that living hope that God has given to us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, One commentator, his last name is Lenski, he said, hope is a key word for this epistle. Throughout this first letter of Peter, we see him referring to hope over and over again. And and this writer said, hope expects something in the future. Hope expects something in the future. That is an anticipation of something better to come. And uh, uh, an expectation, a certain expectation that God is going to make what is wrong now right. That God will turn all things together for good. He will make all things work together for good to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Hope is that confident expectation of what's going to come in the future. And as believers in Christ, more than anybody in the world, we have that, that confident expectation of better things to come. That's hope. And without that 
hope. I, I can't imagine how people who don't have the hope of eternal life in Christ, I can't imagine how they're making it through some of these incredibly trying circumstances that we're going through right now. Because it's the hope of the life to come that gives me perspective on this life now. And yeah, things are difficult, and yeah, the, the Lord might take us home because of disease or, or accident or whatever, but it's the hope of what is coming in the future that allows me to have perspective here and now and allows me to live with these other Advent themes of joy and peace and love because I have hope, and that is what gets me through. In 1 Thessalonians 5.8, Paul said, Since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. I found that verse to be really interesting as I was thinking about this theme of hope, because we know in Ephesians 6, it's a much more well-known passage about the, the armor of God, and a much more complete picture of the full armor of God in Ephesians 6. And in Ephesians 6, Paul refers to the helmet of salvation. But it's interesting when he writes to the Thessalonians, he refers to that same helmet as the helmet of the hope of salvation. So it's that confident expectation that we have been saved, that we are being saved, and that we will be saved completely and totally one day. It's that hope of salvation that guards our minds, that protects us from the arrows of the enemy. It's the hope of salvation that gets us through this life. And why do we have that hope of salvation? Because of the grace of God displayed to us in Jesus Christ. Hope for grace. Number two in this passage here, hope for holiness. Hope for holiness, verses 14 through 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy... You also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. And there, Peter is quoting from Leviticus 11, where God says, You shall be holy, for I am holy. One commentator says, Hope and holiness are closely associated in the scriptures and must not be separated in life. Hope and holiness, he says, are closely associated in the Bible and must not be separated in life. Listen to what John says, the Apostle John in 1 John 3, verse 3. He says, Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So John describes that hope that we have in the Lord as something that purifies us to become pure as he is pure. And that's why the writer says hope and holiness are, t are closely intertwined. That hope that we have in Christ is something that allows us to become holy as he is holy. Now, holiness is that idea of being separated. God is holy because he is other than us. He is different than us. He is separate from sin. God is completely and totally holy, and we know in this life we won't be perfectly holy until we get to heaven and we are glorified and we get to be, uh, we will be perfected by him. But in the meantime, the Bible does say that we are to be holy as he is holy. That's the process that God is at work in us with his Holy Spirit in changing us from the inside out, sanctifying us, making us more and more like Jesus Christ. That's the process of becoming holy as he is holy. I have a little app on my phone that's called Prayer Mate. Uh, I'd recommend it to you if, if you need a little help with maybe being prompted about things to, to pray for, and I use it almost every day. It, my phone alerts me, and I open up the Prayer Mate app, and it has various subjects of things uh, to pray about. And the week that I was preparing this message, one of the things that popped up was something that comes up every week or two about praying for holiness. And it came up the week that I was preparing for this message, and then it also came up again this week. 
uh, while I was preparing even to preach this message that I'd prepared a month ago. And so here's, here's what it says, and this is actually something that comes from Ligonier Ministries, R.C. Sproul's ministry. It says, pray for holiness. The Apostle Peter exhorts us to be holy because God himself is holy, and it references 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. It goes on to say, before the church is anything else, she is set apart for holiness. Therefore, one of the prevailing burdens for us in prayer is to walk in holiness that corresponds to the reality of being positionally set apart by God. This is a challenge because we live in the midst of a world that is not holy. Amen to that. In fact, the world that we live in doesn't regard holiness as a virtue. Our world, our culture, quite frankly, mocks holiness. As a result, we need to continually pray for our church family that we would be a holy people. The Bible tells us to pursue or to strive after holiness with intense effort, Hebrews 12, 14. This unwavering burden to reflect the divine character to one another and to the world around us must be an ongoing prayer. And then it has this brief prayer in the app where it says, Our holy God, make us to prize and pursue your holiness. Strengthen our burden commitment, and endurance to strive daily after holiness in our lives. Oh, what a great thing to pray for ourselves as individuals. What a great thing to pray for our families. And this is something that I pray for for our church. Every time this thing pops up in that prayer mate app and reminds me, I read through this and I pray for our holiness The commentator Lenski again says, To be holy is our obligation, but not in the sense of an outward legal requirement that's laid upon us, for which we must furnish the ability and the power, but as the result of God's call, which furnishes the the power and the ability. The gospel call to holiness always includes the bestowal of this spiritual power. He says, the hand that points us to holiness is the hand that extends its grace to us to make us holy. By pointing us upward, it lifts us upward. In other words, what he's saying is, yes, we are called to be holy, but we are not expected to have the strength, the power, the ability in and of ourselves to be holy. We're completely, again, back to point number one, we're completely dependent upon the grace of God to empower us for holy living. But that's a great thing for us to be praying for. And it's something that we have hope for. If we are in Christ, if we know that we are growing in our relationship with him, we have hope that God will make us over time more and more like himself. And that's what it means to be holy. And we have the ultimate hope that one day when we get to heaven, we will be completely eradicated of sin. Right now, as believers in Christ, we're living with our sins forgiven and washed away. And the penalty of sin is no more. And yet we still, we know that we still struggle with sin in our lives. We're not perfect yet. But we have the hope for holiness that one day sin will be no more. In our lives, it will be completely eradicated. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Wow, what an incredible hope we have. We hope for grace. We hope for holiness. And number three, we hope for ransom. We hope for ransom, verses 17 through 19. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds... Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Wow, we have hope for ransom. Interesting, in verse 17, he says, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. That idea of exile 
is all throughout Scripture. We see God's children in the Old Testament being, uh, being captured and, and taken into exile. Exiled in Babylon. And there's, there's whole big sections of the Old Testament about the children of Israel and their experience in exile. And then being rescued from exile and brought back to their own land. And then here in the New Testament, Peter refers to his readers as those who are in a time of exile. And that describes us as believers in Christ, my friends. We, this world is not our home. We are in exile. We are to be separate from this world. We're to be different. Uh, We are to be recognized by the world around us as not the same as those who are in the world. We're not hopeless like those who are in the world without Christ. We have that hope that one day we'll be in our rightful home. Right now, we're just passing through. So what an incredible theme. It'd really be something worthy of all of us actually to spend some time thinking about and studying. The idea that we are in exile. It's so easy, isn't it, to get wrapped up in the things of this life and to forget that we have a better life to come? To think about all of the, the things of this world and, you know, our homes and, and the food we eat and our jobs and, and our health and our, our sports teams and, you know, you know good teams that we, that, we, that we watch and we celebrate like the Cowboys and, and bad teams that we watch and, and, you know, like the Eagles. Um, you know, we get so wrapped up in the things of, of the here and now the things of of this life. And we forget so easily, don't we? That we're aliens and strangers in this place. That we're exiles here. Just like the children of Israel lived in Babylon, but they knew that they weren't Babylonians. They were longing for that time when they would be back in their homeland and able to to worship in the way that they were intended to by uh, by their God and And by the way, their forefathers worshipped before them. There's a great book that I read recently by David Kinnaman and Mark Matlock called Faith for Exiles. And it's talking about uh, young people today, young believers today, being exiles in this world that we live in. And they call the world that we live in now a digital Babylon. As everything's so technological and, and we as Christians, are exiles in what they refer to as digital Babylon. And they say this, referring here to this passage, uh, referring to this passage and also to the prophet Jeremiah, they kind of tie them together. Here are some of the insights Jeremiah offers to exiles. Exiles should make prayer a mission. Exiles should be faithful and holy. And they quote here 1 Peter 1.17. Uh, where it says, uh, verse 17, to conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. They say other, translation, other translations use the phrase reverent fear to describe the posture of faithful exiles. And they go on to say exiles should be fruitful. Exiles should live for the sake of others. Peter's writings show that the church, even when being persecuted, ought to pray for those in power. Exiles must be wary, realistic, and hopeful. There's that word, hopeful. And then they quote Jeremiah 29, 11, a very well-known verse, where the prophet says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a what? and a hope. Kinnaman and Matlock go on to say exiles should take epic risks to say and do what is right. Exiles should realize that God is at work for good even in exile. Exiles must find their home in God. And then they refer to Jeremiah 29 right after that verse 11 that I just quoted. Verses 12 through 14 can be summarized like this. In those days when you pray, God says, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. God says, I will be found by you if you seek me, if you search for me with all your heart. 
The point of all this, they say, to remind us who follow Jesus that being in exile is a high and ultimately rewarding calling. Well, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. But why are they able to do that? Because of verse 18, he says, knowing that you were ransomed. That is, there's a, a price that was paid for you. You were purchased. Uh, you were enslaved and someone paid the ransom to set you free from that slavery. And what is the price of that ransom? Being ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers? He says, not with perishable things such as silver or gold. Now, in Peter's day, just as much as our day probably, silver and gold were considered incredibly valuable things. These were things that people would love to be purchased by. To have someone pay silver and gold to purchase them would have seemed like a great thing. But here he says, you were ransomed not with perishable things like silver or gold, as valuable as those things may seem. But you were ransomed with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. The price that was paid is invaluable. The precious blood of Jesus Christ, a spotless, blameless lamb. Like Isaiah the prophet said, as a sheep that was led to the slaughter, and as, as a lamb that was led to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He suffered on our behalf. He shed his blood for our sake. And we were ransomed by that incredibly important, valuable, precious blood of Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, he says, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Because you've been ransomed, because you've been set apart, because you are being made holy, you are to be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the hope that is in you. So here as we think about this great theme of hope, as we wrap up this year, as we prepare for a new one, as we, as we finish off our celebration of, of the Christmas season, we are to be the kind of people who live with so much hope that it inspires questions from people who know us. Peter here seems to be, in chapter 3, he seems to have the expectation that his readers, these fellow believers in Christ, will be so hopeful that people in the world around them will ask them about it. Why? What's the reason? Why do you have such hope? People around us ought to be asking us, why are you still experiencing peace? Because this world is so chaotic and so lacking peace. Why are you still showing love to people who don't show love to you? Why are you still joyful, even though this is such a sad season in life? Why? Why do you have hope? When, man, at times you look around this world and it just seems hopeless. Why are you so hopeful? See, Peter expects that we as believers in Christ will live with so much hope that it will be evident. The people around us will wonder, what is up with her? What is going on with him? Why? Why do they have so much hope? And people should be asking us, and we need to be prepared to tell them why. And when he says to, to make a defense, it's not talking about being defensive as if we were under attack, but it simply means to give the reason why. 
to share the purpose that we have hope. And that is because we have the hope of the grace of God that's been given to us and will be ultimately displayed to us when Christ returns. We have the, the hope of, of holiness, of being transformed, of being changed, and being made more like Christ. We have the hope of being ransomed from our futile ways of life and being brought into a new way of living. And then number four, we have hope for glory. We have hope for glory. Verse 20 and 21, he was, speaking of Christ, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So that your faith and hope are in God. Notice uh, when we started this passage, he says, set your hope fully on the grace in verse 13. And then in the last verse of this section, verse 21, he says, so that your faith and hope are in God. I appreciated a, a note in, in my ESV study Bible that, that explains, he says, it says hope functions as an inclusio. That's a literary term. It's an envelope, an inclusio. Hope starts this passage and hope ends this passage. And everything else that's said in between it is, is within the confines of this key concept of hope. Everything that Peter says in verses 13 through 21 are related to the idea that it begins and ends with hope. And that note also said Christians should live in holy fear because they are deeply loved and should not despise that love. God planned from eternity past when he would send Christ and he chose to reveal him at the time in history when these believers lived so that they would enjoy the inexpressible privilege of living in the days of fulfillment. But he explains in this section that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead and gave him glory. Christ's death and resurrection brought him incredible glory. And when we look throughout Scripture, we see these pictures in various places throughout the Bible of, of the, the throne room of God in heaven and the glory that he uh, ex uh, that he displays. Uh, we see times when, when there's uh, visitations from angels to earth and, they, and they're shining and there's, there's brightness and the people who encounter these angels are terrified. Why? Because, because of the glory that emanates from them. In Daniel 7, we see this picture of the, the ancient of days and then it describes the a son of man and the glory that's given to him. And now, as we're reading through our Bible in a year and we're coming towards the end of Revelation, we'll see these pictures of, of heaven and the, the glory of God. And the fact that there's no more need for, uh, for sun or a lamp or any kind of other light in heaven because God himself and Jesus Christ is the light. I believe that uh, Pastor Justin was going to say something about that at our candlelight service. The glory of God displayed in the person of Jesus Christ is something that gives us hope. We hope for the glory to be revealed to us. One day we're going to see such glorious reality that, that anything beautiful that this world had to offer us will pale so far in comparison that we probably won't even remember the beautiful things of this life because it will be so much more glorious in the new heavens and the new earth that God is preparing for us. We have the hope of a glory that is to come. And the Bible also describes we as believers in Christ one day being glorified, being glorified, being made like Jesus Christ. Wow, that almost blows my mind to even think about that. That because we are adopted into God's family, because we are brothers and sisters of Jesus himself, because we are ransomed from our old way of life to the new, because we are born again to a living hope, because of all these things, 
There's glory to come for us. And the greatest glory of all, of course, will, will be to be in the presence of the glorious almighty God and his son, Jesus Christ. Wow. Linsky says, God raised up him who shed his blood and laid down his life for us and then exalted him in glory. In both acts, all the grace of God toward us is manifested mightily, which justifies our faith in him completely and sets before us, foreigners in this world, the most glorious hope. The most glorious hope. No matter what 2020 has thrown at us, and no matter what may come in 2021, some people seem to think that just because the calendar is going to flip to a new year that suddenly everything will be uh, right in the world. But we know that things haven't been getting better. Things are getting worse. And things will probably continue to get worse until Jesus Christ comes again. And yet no matter what, comes no matter what has happened this year or what will happen uh, in the future we have hope because of the glorious reality of what is to come for us who believe in jesus christ hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 says but we see him for a little while who was made lower than the angels namely jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. The author of Hebrews there was describing the fact that we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of all that he went through for us. And one day we will see that glory face to face. Can you imagine how wonderful that's going to be? What a hope we have, my friends. So we have a hope for grace. We have a hope for holiness. We have a hope for ransom. And we have a hope for glory that is to come. I want to finish with just a, a little story that I found. Uh, this was written by or said by a man named James DeLoach. It was quoted in a book called When God Was Taken Captive. And he, James DeLoach says this, I'm not a connoisseur of great art, but from time to time a painting or a picture will really speak a clear, strong message to me. Some time ago I saw a picture of an old, burned-out mountain shack. All that remained was the chimney. And we can kind of relate to that as we've seen homes completely burned away this year, especially in the canyon and Mill City. He says, I saw a picture of an old burned out mountain shack. All that remained was the chimney, the charred debris of what had been the family's sole possession. In front of this destroyed home stood an old grandfatherly looking man dressed only in his underclothes with a small boy clutching a pair of patched overalls. It was evident that the child was crying. Beneath the picture were the words which the artist felt the old man was speaking to the boy. They were simple words, yet they presented a profound theology and philosophy of life. Those words were, Hush, child, God ain't dead. <laughs> Hush, child, God ain't dead dead. How many of you need to contemplate those words today? Has this been a tough year for you? Have you experienced times of, of great pain, maybe even hopelessness, despair, worry? Hush, child, God ain't dead. And then Deloach went on to say this, that vivid picture of that burned-out mountain shack, that old man, that weeping child, and those words, God ain't dead, keep returning to my mind. Instead of it being a reminder of the despair of life, it has come to be a reminder of hope. He says, I need reminders that there is hope in this world, 
And I guess I would add to that, we need reminders that there's hope in this world, but there, there's greater hope in the world to come. Amen? And he finishes by saying, in the midst of all of life's troubles and failures, I need mental pictures to remind me that all is not lost as long as God is alive and in control of this world. Well, if you're following the worship playlist for today, the closing song, I believe, is going to be In Christ Alone. It's a familiar song written by, the, by Keith and Kristen Getty, a modern hymn. One of my favorite songs of all time, in Christ alone. But that, that song begins with this statement, in Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my strength, my light, my song, but in Christ alone, my hope is found. My friends, set your hope on God. We have hope for this life, and better yet, we have hope for the life to come. Because one day we will be in the presence of the one who paid the ransom for our soul, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've just celebrated his birth. And what a great thing to celebrate. His incarnation, his coming from heaven to earth to live as a man. But we need to celebrate even more than that, the fact that he was willing to suffer and die. And the fact that God raised him from the dead. And the fact that he ascended to the right hand of the Father where he is even today, interceding on our behalf. And in the fact that he's going to come again and take us to be with him. That where he is, there we may be also. Oh friends, what hope we have. Will you be the kind of person who lives with such hopefulness? that the people around you want to ask you, why? Why? And you can answer, it's all because of Jesus. Because of Jesus Christ, my Lord, the grace of God displayed in him, I have hope. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the hope that we have. We have hope of what you're going to do with us here in this life, but more importantly, we have hope for the life to come. Because of your sacrifice on our behalf, our Lord Jesus, because of the blood that you shed, because you are the spotless, sinless, blameless Lamb of God who died for our sake and rose again, Lord, of all the people in the world, we ought to be the most hopeful. Lord, I pray that you would give us this great uh, expectation, this anticipation that there is better yet to come. Not just because the calendar is turning to a new year, but because of what your word teaches us about what you have in store for us. That this life is not all there is, that this world is not our home, Father, that one day we're going to be in your presence, we'll see you face to face, we'll worship you in person, we'll celebrate at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Oh, Jesus, we have so much hope because of all that you've done for us. Lord, thank you for the reminder of the hope that we have. Help us to, to take the words of that old man to heart. Hush, child, God ain't dead. Lord, we know that you're not dead. We know that you're alive and well. We know, Jesus, you're coming again. We know we're going to be with you forever. So, Lord, Lord help us not to fret. Help us not to fear. Help us not to worry or despair. But Lord, fill us with that living hope that will have a huge impact on even the people around us as we are such hopeful people. Thank you for giving us this hope. And we pray all these things in the matchless name of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you, my friends. I hope that you had a very Merry Christmas, and I hope and pray that you'll have a great, happy New Year, and I pray and hope that you will live with that hope that God has offered to us. Have a great rest of your day. I love you. God bless.